So the goal of today's uh, talk is going to be uh, to give you guys a working approach to the shoulder patients that you might see in your office. And uh, you may already have a, such an approach, and if you have that, uh, yours may be wor work better than what I'll show you. But if you don't have a good working approach or one that you're comfortable with, I think I can show you one that works well for me, and it's very time efficient and uh, very high yield. So that's going to be the goal. Um, I uh, so far have not been able to get any funding from anybody. I'm sorry to <laughs> announce that again this year, but I'm still trying. But I have no slimy relationships yet. Um, I wanted to throw out a couple questions, and we'll throw them out again at the end. Uh, first question is, which structure is least likely affected by subacromial space impingement? And the options are the subacromial bursa, the supraspinatus muscle and tendon, tendon of the long head of the biceps, and the deltoid muscle and tendon. So think about that, and you can jot down your answer. We'll go over it in, at the end. Another question, um, the most common shoulder glenohumeral joint dislocations are anterior, posterior, inferior, or superior. Think about your answer to that. And <clears> the <throat> last one is the reverse total shoulder. And if you may not have even heard of this, this is a new thing in our discipline, uh, the reverse total shoulder. It's a procedure, and it gets its name from the fact that A, uh, a posterior instead of anterior incision is used. B, or two, the humeral head component is implanted upside down. Three, the ball is on the scapula and the socket is on the humerus. Or four, the posterior muscles are moved the anterior side and vice versa. So think about that and we'll, at the end of the talk you'll be able to answer all of those easily. So uh, we're going to start with anatomy. Uh, almost can't tackle an orthopedic topic without going over a little anatomy. I'm going to make it brief because we don't need to know a lot, uh, but it sure helps to know the little bit that we'll go over. So we're going to start with the deepest layer of structures. We're going to start with the bones and uh, I'm going to try to just use the slide just because the models are going to be pretty hard to see. There may be some instances when I'll have to use the models. There are three bones here that come together to make the shoulder, uh, the clavicle, the scapula, and the humerus. And the scapula is the tough one. I think if I asked you guys to look away from the slide and draw the humerus, everybody would get that right. It's a stick with a ball on the top. And the clavicle is even easier. It's just a stick with a little gentle curve in it. But drawing the scapula would be a challenge. And it's, uh, it's a complicated piece of equipment. And we do need to know a little bit about what it looks like and how it's uh, oriented in space. So I want to spend a second just going over the anatomy of the scapula. It comes in four parts, the body, which is sort of the blade. And that's a surface that's whole purpose is muscle attachment. So if you were to design this uh, and wanted it to be as light and efficient as possible, it's just a thin sheet of bone with all kinds of surface area on it for muscle attachment. And that's all it has to do. Uh, the next piece of the scapula is the glenoid. And the glenoid is the socket part of the ball and socket joint of the glenohumeral joint. Uh, the other thing we talk about, num structure number two, uh, three, is this scapula, spine, and acromion. So on the back of everybody, and you can feel it even on heavy patients, is this bony prominence that tends to be subcutaneous, and that's the scapular spine. And it ends like a hockey stick in this little thumb-shaped piece here, which is called the acromion. So the acromion is sort of the terminus of this scapular spine. And that's a posterior structure, runs along the back of the scapula. The fourth thing is the coracoid process. And the coracoid process is a little finger-like thing that sticks out in the front. It's an anchor spot or an attachment spot for muscle. Uh, but it's a, a little prominence that we'll talk more about, and it factors into shoulder function and pathology. So that's the bony anatomy. Uh, that far slide is looking from the posterior. The middle slide is what it would look like if I could take the humerus off and show you the sort of glenoid dead on. And then this is an anterior view. Uh, next slide, whenever you have uh, a couple of boints, bones that articulate against each other, you have a joint. And in the shoulder, we actually have two joints. Uh, we always talk about the shoulder joint. There isn't really a shoulder joint. There's the glenohumeral joint, which gets most of the publicity. That's this one here. And a smaller, less important joint called the acromioclavicular joint. And that's this little joint between the clavicle and the acromion. And there can be problems here in, in shoulder pathology there, so it's worth talking about. There's even a third joint that's uh, really esoteric, which is the scapulothoracic articulation. The joint, if you can call it a joint, between the scapula and the chest wall. Uh, problems there are so rare, I don't think we need to waste our time on it. But the, technically speaking, there's a third shoulder joint. Uh, but these two are plenty for today. 
Uh, next step, if you have joints, you need systems of ligaments to stabilize them. So the next layer out is the ligament systems that stabilize these two joints. And the ligaments that stabilize the glenohumeral joint, they originate along the rim of the socket and they go out and attach to the humerus. And these bands of collagen are part of the capsule. The capsule is a sheet or an envelope that goes all the way around 360 degrees to hold the fluid in the joint. And there are bands of fortification in that capsule, which we have studied and pointed out and made names for. Uh, and it's, it's kind of arbitrary, really. We used to have to memorize all those names of those different bands for our uh, testing in orthopedics. It's a little silly, the, but the concept is valid, and that is that there are these bands, you can actually see them, of fortification in the capsule wall, which are the ligaments that hold the ball in the socket, the glenohumeral joint stabilizing ligaments. There's a similar system of bands in the capsule that uh, closes off the AC joint. So there are bands in this capsule called the acromioclavicular ligaments. And then the interesting thing about the AC joint is that there are a remote set of ligaments that go from the coracoid process, that little pinky finger that sticks out in the front, up to the clavicle. So since the coracoid and the acromion are two parts of the same bone, if you're stabilizing the clavicle to the coracoid, you are by definition stabilizing it to the acromion. So these, these little ligaments over here are actually stabilizing that joint. And they, uh, they're important, and we'll see why in just a little bit. So we have a system of ligaments to stabilize our joints. Next layer out from that is the deepest layer of muscle, which is the rotator cuff. And uh, the rotator cuff muscles, there are four of them, but really only three that you need to remember. Uh, and I think this model is, is the best for showing that. So this would sit inside of you like this. Here's your collarbone, your humerus there, and the scapula sort of in the back. And if you remember the scapular spine, the muscle that's above the scapular spine is the supraspinatus, uh, which makes sense. The one that's below the scapular spine, infraspinatus. Remember, this is orthopedic, so it's going to be pretty simple. Uh, and then the other one, who's, the name of the third one is also just as uh, logical. It's called the subscapularis. And the reason it's called that isn't as obvious when you hold this up. But if you looked at a skeleton where this was plastered against the uh, chest wall, it's very hard to look under and see the subscapularis. It's really buried beneath the scapula. So even that name makes sense. So all three of the names, if you forget them, you can sort of invent or derive them based on just the anatomy. And uh, this is a sh uh, picture from the front. And it shows the subscapularis, with the anterior rotator cuff muscle. And then the supraspinatus, which is on top. That's this one, remember, above the scapular spine. Uh, if we look at it from another view, this is a, or sorry, same view, just a little different picture. Anterior, again, subscapularis, supraspinatus up here. Then we'll flip it around, look at the back side of it here. So this is the infraspinatus, which is going to fan out and occupy this whole surface here. So that's what's happening here. This is infraspinatus below the scapular spine, attaching the humerus supraspinatus above. And this is the fourth one that I want you to forget, which is the teres minor. And the teres minor, uh, as its name might imply, plays a minor role in shoulder function and in shoulder pathology. So it's probably more efficient to just forget that one and save that brain space for something else. Um, I'm going to skip that slide for a second. So the next uh, layer out from the rotator cuff is the bursa. And the bursa is a uh, sac of a uh, little slimy fluid to help it move and be lubricated that's superficial to the rotator cuff. And then on top of that is the deltoid. And one of the things that's interesting, at least to me, and th something that's changed since I was in medical school, is our understanding of how the deltoid muscle and the rotator cuff work together. When I was a medical student, even when I was an orthopedic resident, we were taught incorrectly that the supraspinatus rotator cuff muscle is responsible for the first 30 degrees of shoulder abduction. Okay? And at the time, it totally made sense that that's what that, that conclusion was, seemed valid. And it seemed valid because when people had torn their supraspinatus rotator cuff muscle, they suddenly couldn't initiate abduction. They could not abduct that first 30 degrees. If you took such a person and abducted past 30 degrees for them, they could take it from there and go up. But they just couldn't get started. They couldn't do that first 30 degrees. And then if we fix the supraspinatus rotator cuff tear, magic. They can do it all again. If they tore it again, they lost it again. We saw that over and over again. And we said, OK, that must be telling us that that's what that muscle does. But that's not true. And we've just recently sort of appreciated what the rotator cuff 
Superspinaeus and the others actually does do. And to explain that, I want to go over three bio or biomechanical kinematic principles. Uh, <clears throat> one is that the glenoid is a very, very shallow and very, very small socket. It's very different from the socket in the hip joint, which is a big socket that goes all the way around the ball. In the glenoid, it's just a little shallow thing like the surface of a golf tee. And the humeral head sits in that, but it's not really captured or contained by it. The second principle is that when your arm is at your side, the deltoid muscle force vector is essentially vertical. The deltoid goes way down. It attaches very, very low on the humerus, about a third to a half the way down towards your elbow. And when your arm is at your side and the deltoid contracts, it's basically pulling straight superior. And then the last thing is that the deltoid attachment is way over here on the lateral side of the humerus, lateral to the center of rotation of the glenohumeral joint, which is approximately there. So, and I think that's what this slide is going to show, yeah. So if you can buy into those three postulates, uh, we can understand a better idea of how the deltoid and rotator cuff work together. This is what our shoulder would look like if our glenoid looked like an acetabulum, if it had bone that really captured the ball. If this is the center of rotation and we apply a force lateral to the center of rotation, for a split second the humerus will translate up, but it can't go very far because it hits the socket. And as soon as it stops, it's going to start to rotate, okay, because the force is applied to the lateral side of the humerus, so you get rotation. Well, this is what our glenohumeral joints look like. And if you impart a vertical force on that joint, the humerus translates up. Okay? Uh, it just, there's nothing to stop it from going up. If you take that humerus, though, and abduct it 30 degrees, then as the deltoid contracts, it actually drives the humeral head into the glenoid. It can't go anywhere, so it actually starts to rotate. So with no rotator cuff, just a deltoid, a ball, and a socket, you can behave sort of like somebody who has a rotator cuff tear. You can't initiate, but if somebody else brings you past 30 degrees, you can go the rest of the way. Um, so what the rotator cuff really does is it provides all kinds of little force vectors that help hold the glenoid in the socket. And if you've got that sort of suction force holding the so ball in the socket, even the little lip, the little ramp at the top of that shallow glenoid is enough to capture the ball. Okay? So if, you're, if you have that capture, then the deltoid can abduct. Uh, and that's why uh, the deltoid uh, it made a lot of the things that in our old model didn't make sense. One is that the deltoid is much bigger muscle than the supraspinatus, so it made no sense that it would need the help of that little muscle to initiate, ab initiate abduction. And there were some other inconsistencies that we'll go over. But uh, this model is, uh, we've, we believe, is a much more accurate way of understanding how the rotator cuff works and how it helps facilitate the deltoid, which is really the muscle that does abduction. Um, all right, enough of that. Let's talk about seeing patients. The patients that you see, almost, uh, if you're seeing them in just a regular clinical setting, not in an emergency room, but people who come in in an elective practice complaining of shoulder pain, they'll sort themselves out into one of three sort of general categories. And this is probably true of 90% of the shoulders that I see in my practice. I'm predicting that what the shoulders that you'll see in your practice. Uh, the biggest group and the most important group is the impingement group. So I want to go over that first. And if you're going to go to sleep, go to sleep after this first part. <laughs> Uh, the other parts are interesting, but not. this is really the nut of the talk, is this impingement part. So let's talk about subacromial space impingement. And to understand subacromial space impingement, we've got to spend a second just talking about the subacromial space. And this is a cross-sectional AP uh, of, uh, of this. So we're looking like this at the front of the shoulder. And uh, you can, hopefully, this is starting to look familiar. There's the clavicle, the AC joint, the acromion. This is the humeral head, the glenoid. This is the top muscle of the rotator cuff group, which again is the supraspinatus. And the supraspinatus muscle is transitioning into the supraspinatus tendon, which attaches to the humerus. This is the subacromial bursa, a little sac. And uh, the British like to call it the subdeltoid bursa. And they're right. It's about 50% under the deltoid, 50% under the acromion. So you can call it either way. Uh, this same set of structures looked at from this view, where you're looking dead on this way. Uh, looks like this. So we've made the humeral head trans transparent so we can look through and see the glenoid here. This is the subscapularis in the front, supraspinatus in the top, infraspinatus posteriorly, and the little teres minor that we're going to forget about. This is the acromion, and this is the subacromial space right here. This is the coracoid process in the front. So the problem with rotator cuff impingement or subacromial space impingement, I should, should say, 
is that in human shoulders, when you abduct or forward flex your humerus, the space between the acromion and the rotator cuff gets very narrow. It, it shouldn't contact in a normal shoulder, but it doesn't take much swelling on the soft tissues or calcium deposit on the hard tissues to narrow the space enough that you do get contact. And we call that contact impingement. And uh, in this drawing, you can see how the bursa can be impinged. The rotator cuff itself can be impinged. And uh, because of its location, the rotator cuff muscle that is most commonly impinged is the supraspinatus. It's, you can bring any rotator cuff muscle up under the acromion, but the one that spends most of its time there is supraspinatus. So most impingement pathology is on supraspinatus. And this is one of the reasons why the teres minor isn't that important. It goes, it's a little muscle that attaches on this little pad here and goes like my finger. And to get it up under the ac acromion to impinge, you'd have to get into a kind of a ridiculous position that we're just not in enough to cause impingement. So uh, that's one of the reasons we can forget about the infraspinatus. So impingement uh, bothers the occupants of the subacromial space. And there are three occupants, two there, the bursa and the rotator cuff. And the third occupant is the biceps. And uh, like its name implies, the biceps muscles ha muscle has two heads, uh, a long and a short head. And they're not that much different in length. I think we could have come up with a better way to name them. Uh, but uh, the long head, this head here, actually uh, occupies the subacromial space and can be impinged upon. This, is, this model shows the long head of the biceps tendon, and you can see how it can rub against the acromion and become a victim of impingement. I don't know how many of you people have seen this guy in your office, but uh, this is somebody who has rubbed that uh, long head biceps tendon over and over again, and just like the rope on the Wile E. Coyote uh, cartoon, it, it gets to a little string and then it tears. And usually these people have a relatively innocuous uh, event, picking up the trash to put in the dumpster or something, and their shoulder pops. <clears throat> and it wasn't because that was a particularly huge trash bag that day. It was because that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And it's really the consequence of long-term biceps impingement against the acromion and then some event that makes it tear. So uh, <clears throat> the third occupant of the subacromial space and the third thing that can get impinged upon other than the rotator cuff and the bursa is the biceps tendon. So I think it's helpful to think about impingement as this continuum, okay? The least severe is bursitis. And the bursitis impinger just has an inflamed bursa that's swollen. And as soon as the bursa gets swollen, there's just not enough room in here for a swollen bursa. So when they bring their arm up, they pinch the bursa. And uh, I always tell patients, it's like when you bite the inside of your cheek. The more swollen it is, the more you're going to pinch it. And the more you pinch it, the more swollen it gets. So this thing can sort of be a self-propagating uh, problem, impingement. Uh, if you go up a little bit farther on the continuum, then you're actually impinging against the biceps and the rotator cuff. So now the rotator cuff and the biceps are inflamed and getting impinged upon. And if you do that long enough, <clears throat> if, you, if you rub against the biceps tendon or the rotator cuff long enough, you'll actually wear yourself a hole. Uh, just like we talked about the biceps tendon rupture being an attritional rupture, one of accumulated trauma, rotator cuff tears are the same thing. The vast majority of rotator cuff tears aren't a perfectly normal rotator cuff muscle that suddenly experiences some overwhelming force and tears. Uh, that would be the way we tear our quadriceps muscle or other muscle tears. But rotator cuff muscle tears are different. They tear because of an accumulation of wear against the acromion. And just like our model of the biceps, it gets thin enough that one day something that's relatively innocuous uh, will tear it. Um, the next step up is something that's pretty rare but kind of interesting to look at. And this is this example of cuff tear arthropathy. And I want to show an example of that. This is actually a, uh, an x-ray, an AP x-ray of all the stuff we've been talking about of the shoulder joint. Here's the scapula. Up there is the AC joint, the chromium. This is the subacromial space, humeral head, and glenoid. And looking at that x-ray, we can't really say anything about what's going on in the subacromial space. Uh, we don't know if it's totally normal. We don't know if there's a bursitis, a rotator cuff tear, because uh, all that stuff is soft tissue. But compare, take a mental snapshot of that x-ray and compare it to this x-ray. Yep. OK, great. The question is, can we say that there's no impingement? We can say that there's no impingement in this position of the arm. But the problem is somebody who has that x-ray, as they raise their arm up, could impinge. 
And uh, they, they could actually even be impinging here if the subacromial space occupants were swollen enough that they were touching the bone there. So it's possible, it's unlikely that they would impinge with their arm at their side, but they could have a condition that as soon as we abduct or forward flex their arm, it would narrow enough that they could impinge. Okay, that's a good question. So here's uh, the next x-ray, and in this x-ray, and it's a little hard to see, I apologize for that, but uh, <clears throat> that's the acromion and that's the humeral head. And the subacromial space, if there really is one, is a half millimeter thick. Uh, so there is no way that any rotator cuff is living in that space, or anything is living in that space. So this is one of the few times you can look at an x-ray and tell with 100% certainty that there's a rotator cuff tear. And uh, if you guys had to guess, uh, would you guess that that tear is a big tear or a small tear? Big, yeah, it's a big tear. Because remember, the rotator, the supraspinatus, is supposed to come across here, go all the way over and attach here. So we know that it, at least, at best case scenario, it's sitting here. It may be back this way, but it's nowhere farther lateral than there. It would open up the space. So that sort of uh, uh, medial to lateral dimension is huge. And uh, rotator cuff tears, if you look down from, <coughs> from above, just to get a perspective on what we're looking at, uh, and then we'll put some muscle in there and get rid of the bone. So that's the, what we're looking at as looking at above. This is the supraspinatus, infraspinatus in the back, subscap in the front. Uh, rotator cuff tears tend to look like that. <coughs> they tend to have an AP dimension and a medial lateral dimension. And they, the AP dimension actually tends to be bigger than the medial lateral direction, uh, dimension. So the little dimension in our example was huge. This dimension is going to be double huge. Uh, <coughs> this is a slightly bigger rotator cuff tear. And the one we're talking about is even bigger than that. So this is a massive, massive rotator cuff tear. <coughs> I always tell patients that uh, ro wearing out your rotator cuff is sort of like wearing out the kneecap on a pair of jeans. At first, it's just kind of fuzzy and, uh, and irritated. And then it gets kind of stringy. And then one day you can see through there, and that's when you have a full thickness tear. Well, this tear is sort of like my daughter's jeans, which look like this. And uh, <clears throat> this is a huge hole. And it's more than just a tear. It is actually an area defect. There's a, a volume or an area of tissue missing. And what's left is really fuzzy and, and uh, unreliable. So it's, it's impossible to fix this. Okay, this is not a fixable rotator cuff tear. I can't bring the edges together because there isn't enough stuff. And if I try to put stitches in the edges of that, it just pull through. So this, is, this uh, example I'm showing you is an unrepairable rotator cuff tear. There's just no way we can fix that. Too big of a defect. And unlike jeans, you can't put a static patch on it and expect it to work. The cuff to work has to be dynamic. It has to be pulling and holding the ball in the shoulder. And the tension in the rotator cuff muscles changes in all the different positions of your arm. So we don't have anything sophisticated like that to patch it with that will contract and adjust its contraction in coordination with the other rotator cuff muscles. So for a long, long time, this was sort of, uh, you know, go to pain management. Go back to your primary care was our favorite thing to do uh, for those patients. Uh, one of the things that bugged us about these patients for a long time, and it was an inconsistency in our idea, was in this situation where the, the supraspinatus and other rotator cuff muscles are gone, the humeral head is up. And that didn't, that always bothered us because if you cut the, the supraspinatus, you would expect the humerus to fall down. And we kind of ignored that, uh, even though it bothered everybody. But now the new idea of the deltoid pulling up uh, explains this. Uh, the deltoid, even its resting, uh, resting tone will drive the humerus up. And every time this patient tries to raise their arm, it just does this. And over time, they've actually eroded a, a concavity on the underside of the acromion, just like a mortar in a pestle. So that totally fits the new model of the deltoid unopposed causing superior translation instead of rotation. So uh, we have a new solution for this patient. It's brand new like eight years old, but that's brand new. Uh, and uh, I'll explain, it's really exciting because when I trained, we had no solution for this patient. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, believe it or not, we orthopedists use the same tools you guys use when we see patients' history, physical exam, and studies. And history-wise, the thing that really stands out for the impingers is that their pain is worse with overhead positioning. And we totally can understand why that would be because that's the position that shuts down the space and causes impingement. They can also get pain when they reach behind their back and we think that that might be 
the impingement area, this inflamed area, perhaps rubbing against the coracoid process in the front. Uh, for some reason, pain at night is common. And the thing can radiate down to the upper end of the humerus. I have a lot of patients who come in and their little intake sheet says arm pain, and they're impingers, but they're radiating down into here. Um, the uh, physical exam, can I borrow? Can I borrow you to demonstrate it? Great. And I'm going to um, give you a real quick and dirty physical exam. I'm going to have you stand here if you don't mind. And then just kind of face me like that. That's maybe a little less. Great. That's perfect. Um, so the first thing I want to do is try to understand, is this patient in the impingement bucket or one of the other two buckets we haven't talked about? And the best way to do that is to just do forward flexion and abduction. And what I'm doing is I'm closing that space. And if I can reproduce her pain doing that, especially if it starts hurting above 90 degrees, I think, okay, this might be an impinger. The other thing that helps is bring your arms behind your back. And I'm going to press on here on both sides in the front. And if they say that the part that's really bothering them hurts a lot more when I press with my thumb there, that's a strong sign of impingement. And it's a strong sign because that little neighborhood that's getting bumped against the acromion, when we bring our arm behind our back, it brings it out from underneath the acromion where we can press on it. Okay? And I can't tell you with certainty whether I'm, it's the biceps tendon that's hurting or the bursa. It's probably a little of everything. But it's just telling me, okay, the impingement area is inflamed or tender. So that's a strong sign too. Just tenderness over the anterior part of the shoulder. It's right under the skin. You can feel it, especially in a thin person. Um, and then the, another part that's, that uh, helps us out is doing rotator cuff strength testing. And this is something we can do right in the office. And this is going to help us say, okay, well now I've got an impinger. Where on that continuum is this patient? Okay, so I'm going to have you face me. And uh, maybe, sorry, maybe just a little less. I'm going to have you hold your elbows against your side like this. I'm going to have you rotate your elbows out, good, and back into the middle. I should say rotate your forearms out. You did it perfectly. Uh, and then I'll have you start in the starting position. And this time, same thing against me. Rotate out against me. Good. So I'm measuring how hard she's pushing out against me and then in toward the middle. Good. So that's checking her ability to push out and push in, okay? And uh, anybody guess which muscle is responsible for external rotation to out? Yeah, I hear it whispering out there. Not a lot of confidence, but the right answer nonetheless, infraspinatus. So when muscles work, they can only shorten. And uh, if you think about remember, this is posterior in the back. So infraspinatus originates here, inserts there, and as it shortens, it's going to rotate the humerus out. Okay? Opposite internal rotation is going to be this guy, subscap. Okay? And for a long time, that was all we could agree upon in orthopedics. Everyone agreed that those were the tests for those two muscles. But the most important one, the one we really needed a test for, was supraspinatus. And there were 20 or 30 different tests for that. And nobody agreed on which one was the best until a guy named Job took all the tests that people were using and then used electromyography to say, OK, of each of these tests, which one actually stimulates the supraspinatus? And the winner is what's now called Job's test. And I'll, have you, I'll show you that one. I'll have you straighten your arms out and turn your thumbs upside down and then push up toward the ceiling. So this is the empty can test, and you can do it straight ahead, you can do it out to the side. And I have to memorize that one. I can derive that and that, but I have to memorize that, okay? But that's the one to remember. If you're gonna forget any of them, forget all of them but that. That's the one we need the most, the supraspinatus rotator cuff strength test. Um, it's in a couple things I've learned the hard way about this stuff. Number one, I used to just go up to people and I'd say, okay, push out against me. And half of them did this, and half of them did that. Okay, and we don't want this. So now I say, rotate your elbows out like this, and then back to the middle, and then same thing against me. So now I know that, I've, that we're doing rotation. Okay? <clears throat> the other thing, when you check supraspinatus, that's the empty can one, uh, you've got to make sure that you're not parallel to the ground. You have to be pointed down some. Okay? And the reason for that is, <clears throat> um, I think we're done, thanks. Um, the reason for that is we don't want to be impinging when we're testing, okay? <clears throat> Let's say that, uh, actually, can I borrow you for one more second? Sorry. <laughs> Let's say that you're my patient and you're coming here with right shoulder pain and uh, you have tenderness with your arm on your back. It hurts when I bring you up here. It's like, ah, that's it right there. And then I'm testing your rotator cuff and you have no pain with external rotation, so that's infraspinatus, no pain with subscap, no pain with supraspinatus. Where do you think this patient is on the continuum? 
Any thoughts? Yeah, bursitis. If you have an angry inflamed bursa, as long as I'm not checking it up here where it's pinched, you'll have no pain and no weakness, okay? Um, if, same patient, but now no pain out, no pain in, but uh, we'll do the empty can test, and now it hurts a ton, and she's a little weak on that side, I know that it's more than just bursitis, okay? The rotator cuff is malfunctioning. It's not, uh, the supraspinatus isn't pushing. So it can be malfunctioning because it's inflamed, which is rotator cuff tendonitis, the next step up on the continuum. It can be malfunctioning because it's torn. If it's torn, it's going to be weak and painful. I think we're really done this time, thanks. Um, so it tells me I'm one step ahead on the continuum from bursitis. So that simple physical exam testing helps us locate somebody on the continuum. If they have impingement pain but no uh, problems with rotator cuff strength, uh, then they have a bursitis. Uh, and to, for that test to be valid, you have to test their rotator cuff strength down where the space is open, okay? Um, and uh, there is a more sophisticated test now for, for subscap, which is either the belly test or the arm liftoff test, and we can go into that later. But, but for a simple uh, explanation, internal and external rotation will work for checking extra, or, uh, subscap in and infraspinatus out. Um, the, uh, to continue our sort of uh, uh, our diagnosis of where they are in the continuum, we have to do another step, which we'll go to in just a second, but this is just going over resisted internal rotation check subscap, resisted external rotation checks infraspinatus, and the Job's test for supraspinatus. Uh, um, Studies-wise, we can get some x-rays. If you're going to get an x-ray, the x-ray to get is this uh, Y view. This is how you take it. You put the film here, shoot the x-ray approximately parallel to the scapular spine. And if you ask for a Y view, most techs know this. This is what you get. And you get the view you would get if we took the humerus off and looked straight at it. And it's neat because it really shows the subacromial space well. Most of the bone spurs hang off the front of the acromion, so you can really see something like whoops a big subacromial spur intruding down into the subacromial space. It's very common for us as we grow older to apply calcium, to collect calcium on the underside of the acromion, to calcify the core coracromial ligament and grow these spurs. So this is sort of like atherosclerosis and calcium, calcium deposit in uh, vessels. Everybody, if you live long enough, is going to get narrowing of the subacromial space, and that's why impingement is so common, especially if you're over 50. Um, MRI is also a good study. We can do an MRI and look for the supraspinatus. There it is going all the way over and, att and attaching normally. And then here there is a supraspinatus tear with a little gap and some fluid going through it. Uh, so the MRI is very diagnostic, but I don't know that we need it as often as we use it. Uh, we probably overuse it. Uh, and I'll try to explain how we can get, do excellent medicine without even having to employ it. Uh, this is just a, a, what I think is a neat uh, MRI showing impingement. There's the subacromion, or the acromion, the underside of the acromion. Here's supraspinatus. And you just can see that this is with the arm at the side, the impingement happening in the subacromial space. Um, what about treatment? Well, the treatment, interestingly, we can use this same first step of treatment for everybody on the impingement continuum, including the big, hairy, rotator cuff, uh, arthropathy, superior humeral head migration person. Oral anti inflammatory medications help because if we can uninflame the structure that's impinging, we have better clearance. And better clearance equals more comfort in impingement. So anything we can do to decrease inflammation helps. Physical therapy helps, but you have to be kind of specific about it. Uh, if you just send somebody with a thing that says physical therapy, they might get a, a physical therapy favorite, which is the wall walk. And this is just going to have them impinge over and over again. So it's like purposefully biting your cheek when you have that uh, problem. So we, and I'm not trying to short sell the physical therapist. Many of them are sophisticated enough to know that that's not right. But you'll cover your bets better to write a little bit more of a detailed prescription. And all you have to ask for is uh, ask them to avoid overhead positions until the symptoms improve. There's a trick called scapular retraction, which is a postural thing. And I'm a huge sloucher. Uh, and if you slouch forward, it actually shuts down the subacromial space. So teaching people to bring their shoulder blades back is better for a million reasons, including impingement. So a big part of the physical therapy is having them feel their shoulder blades sucking together in the back, and the scapular retraction has been shown to open the subacromial space and make a big difference. We're also going to teach them internal and external progressive resistance exercises with their arm at their side. So this is a little rubber band thing out and back, okay? To, and this, what this does is it strengthens 
infraspinatus and subscap, which both have a downward force vector. And they can actually bring the humeral head down and increase the subacromial space clearance. And I used to write this prescription and send it out. And uh, then we got this rubbery band stuff. And I would give the rubbery band stuff to patients and just say, put your arm at your side, tie it over to a doorknob and do that to help infraspinatus, then tie it over there and pull it across your stomach to do uh, subscap. Or, uh, yeah, subscap. And that, was, that worked great. Uh, and then we ran out of the rubbery stuff, and I, we never had it since. And uh, now you can do it by just asking patients to go to an opening in a doorway and push isometrically, external rotate against that, and then just go to the other side of the doorway and push your palm, and just have them hold it uh, 30 seconds to a minute, you know, 10 times, three times a day. And that will probably suffice uh, for a starter level, at least, of physical therapy. And we're trying to strengthen these muscles, which bring the humeral head down, and affect a subacromial space opening. Um, if that doesn't work, uh, the next step is a cortisone shot, and the cortisone shot in the subacromial space. And again, all we're trying to do is decrease inflammation here to increase clearance in the subacromial space injection. The, uh, the cortisone injection, uh, I wish I had time because I, I have some models that I can show you this better. Maybe we can do that another day. But uh, there, it just basically the concept is putting a, a bolus of anti-inflammatory medicine into the subacromial space to uh, decrease inflammation there. And if you give a shot, there are four possible outcomes. Uh, the first is that they get better and stay better. That's what we're hoping for. That would be the ideal. Uh, if they get better for a long time and then come back, and I have people who I don't see for a year, and then they're like helping their wife wallpaper the ceiling or something, and they're doing a lot of overhead work, and they impinge again. So they probably have a spur or some calcium deposit or some anatomy that predisposes them to impingement. They're going to come in anytime they do repetitive overhead stuff. But if it's infrequently, once a year, it totally makes sense to just re-inject them. They don't need an operation if it's happening that infrequently. Uh, if it's getting, if it works, but then it comes back in a short amount of time, less than four months, uh, it's too soon to give them another injection. We sort of use four months as a rule of thumb on how frequently you can re-inject in orthopedics for, with corticosteroids. So if they got great relief for a month and then come back, that's my favorite patient because that's a patient that's going to do great with surgery. Uh, they have proven to me that I've got the diagnosis right but because they got better with the subacromial space injection and uh, didn't work long enough that we can repeat it. The surgical solution for this patient is ideal. If they come back or usually they call me and they say, boy, you know, that shot did nothing. Not a day, not an hour, nothing. I got no relief from that. Then I start thinking, well, maybe my uh, diagnosis is incorrect. Maybe they're not in the impingement bucket. They might be in some other kind of problem. Uh, they may have another problem. So on those patients, I do get an MRI. Uh, and that's when I think an MRI will help. I think we overuse it because we just get it on everybody with shoulder pain. And the thing that's tricky is if you take people over 50 and do MRIs of their asymptomatic, totally normal uh, shoulders, uh, or I shouldn't say totally normal, people have no complaints, you find a ton of impingement pathology, partial tears, full thickness tears in asymptomatic patients, small ones. But it leads us sometimes to over-treat. And one of the reasons that... Uh, impingement surgery has a black eye is I think we see somebody with shoulder pain, we get an MRI, the MRI report says impingement, we take them to the operating room and do an impingement operation. And the whole time it was something else. Uh, so I think the, the cortisone shot and its result is more predictive for me of how somebody's going to do with surgical treatment than an MRI image. Uh, so I favor the cortisone result uh, as a predictor of who needs surgery and who doesn't. The surgery, when we do it, no, oh, sorry, this is an example of what things you might find on an MRI that aren't impingement, that look like impingement, and this is called the slap lesion. It's a stupid name, superior labrum, anterior to posterior. Don't ask me why it got called that. But the biceps tendon we talked about anchors to the labrum. It can pull the labrum free, and you can have this sort of meniscus tear of the shoulder. And there are a list of things that can look like impingement but aren't. They won't get better with the subacromial space injection, and you can find that stuff on an MRI. Um, the surgical treatment, uh, is two things. Number one, a subacromial decompression. And that's where we take a, a tool and basically sand off or saw off the underside of the acromion. So there's a thin bone, but we can make it even thinner and thereby increase the dimensions of the subacromial space and eliminate impingement. And that can be done arthroscopically with a little burr, or you can open it up and do it with a saw, and the results are just as good with both technique. Uh, this is just a picture of how it looks. Uh, I'm doing this one with a scope. I'm just sort of mowing the lawn, going back and forth like this. And I've, I haven't gotten here yet, but this will all go away. This down here is the top side of supraspinatus. The white fluffy stuff is the bursa, which we resect to do this. And then you grow a new bursa, which is kind of neat. But when we're done, 
we have a much wider subacromial space that doesn't impinge in any part of the range of motion. So that's the, the surgical solution. When we're in there, we'll look at the rotator cuff. This is a picture, if you imagine looking out of my pen, up under, I'm in the glenohumeral joint, I'm looking at the roof of the glenohumeral joint, which is the underbelly of supraspinatus. And here's a normal one. The supraspinatus is attaching to the humerus. And here's one that has a rotator cuff tear. This is a little gap, an opening, uh, shaped like the ones we drew earlier in the talk, where there's a communication I can see up into the subacromial space here. So uh, if I'm doing my subacromial decompression, I've got the scope in the shoulder. I'm looking around. I can discover this. And if it's torn, I sew it back together. So I add the extra step of a rotator cuff repair. If it's not torn, just fuzzy and angry, taking off the acromion bone does the trick. So we do the subacromial decompression. We add the rotator cuff repair if it's necessary. If it's not, uh, we don't have to have that step. So I don't need an MRI before this operation to tell me if they have a cuff tear or not. Uh, my going in and looking actually is more accurate than looking at a picture. And uh, go, I, we have the same equipment going into the operation either way, whether we know there's a cuff tear or not. Uh, that's just showing a diagram of repairing a supraspinatus rotator cuff tear. Um, so that's it for impingement. Glenohumeral joint problems, anytime you have a joint of any kind, that can have two basic problems, arthritis and instability. And this is just an example of the instability that you see in the glenohumeral joint. This is a glenohumeral joint dislocation. Uh, can anybody tell me whether that's an anterior <coughs> dislocation, a posterior dislocation? Yeah, the answer is probably anterior. Uh, and the, the real answer is you can't tell from a single x-ray. The ball could be in front or behind, and from that front view x-ray, it'll look the same. But if you're a gambling person, uh, pick anterior because the vast majority are anterior. And uh, the reason that they're, uh, and the, the x-ray that you need to sort of prove that is that Y view x-ray, which we use to look under the acromion. It also is great for looking at where the humerus is anterior to posterior with respect to the glenoid. And this is a Y view x-ray. And you know, here's the Y. You can see it really well with the humerus out of the way. Uh, <laughs> that's posterior. This is anterior because there's the coracoid, which is an anterior feature, the ribs, all that. So the humor is very easy to see. And you can do that with a patient in the sling. That view doesn't require any uncomfortable positioning in the ER. So an AP and a Y view are the best x-rays to get to uh, analyze dislocation. Um, the dislocations are most often anterior, just like you guys predicted. And the way to mem you can memorize that, or you can just look at this uh, diagram, and you'll never forget it. <clears throat> this thing does not sit in my body like this. If it did, my clavicle would be shooting straight ahead. The whole thing's rotated 45 degrees, which means that the glenoid is actually sitting in me like this. So it's helping. There's a lot more bone behind the humeral head. There's really nothing in front to keep the ball from coming out the front. So we have bony uh, structure behind to keep the humerus from going posteriorly. We have nothing to keep it going from, from going anteriorly. So it makes sense that the ball is going to most likely dislocate anteriorly. Um, Anterior dislocations are probably 90% of glenohumeral joint dislocations that we see. You really can't go superior because you've got the acromion up there. Uh, inferior exists, and they're dangerous because they often cause compromise to the big vessels, the axillary artery and vein, and the uh, nerves that travel in the axilla. Uh, and then the, there is a posterior dislocation, and uh, that's about 10%. So it's not trivial. There are some. Uh, there are two conditions that are classic for creating posterior dislocations. One is a seizure, and the other is an electrocution injury. And uh, the, uh, in both of those conditions, you have a maximal simultaneous contraction of all of the muscles, intrinsically. So it's not an externally applied force. It's the intrinsic forces applied by your own muscles. And the way we're built in that tug of war, the posterior muscles are stronger than the anterior muscles, so you get a posterior dislocation. So if you're moonlighting and somebody's being wheeled off to x-ray and they had, have, had, had a seizure, you can bet your colleagues it's going to be a posterior dislocation. They'll take the bet because it's never posterior, and you'll be right in those instances. Um, these are some techniques for putting uh, shoulder dislocations back. Uh, if, uh, these are from history, obviously. And uh, whether you use pulleys or ropes or naked midgets or whatever you want to use, uh, the, the concept is it takes a lot more force than you would think to pop one of these things in. And luckily, we have something these poor guys didn't have, which is uh, pharma pharmacology. And uh, these days, uh, glenohumeral joint reduction, uh, uh, reducing a dislocated shoulder, is almost a pharmacological event. Uh, if you can, it's, it's very hard for you, no matter how big and strong you are, 
with your arm muscles to overpower somebody's chest and latissimus muscles, even if they're a little wrinkly old lady that you could, you know, flick and knock over. Uh, those muscles are strong, and it's amazing how much of a fight they'll put up. So we just uh, use uh, anesthesia, basically, or sedation to relax those muscles. And once the muscles are relaxed, the reduction is pretty simple. Uh, if you're moonlighting in the ER, you've probably done this before. This is a technique that I like because uh, an assistant keeps the patient on the bed with a sheet around the patient's chest. I put a sheet around my waist, and just by leaning backward, I can pull traction with my body, which is I can put a lot more force there than I can pull with my hand, and that lets me kind of rotate the humerus and abduct it to pop it in. Uh, I will warn you, and I've learned this the hard way myself, always make sure the Narcan bottle's in the room, maybe even loaded up in the syringe, uh, and uh, look at the patient and say, you know, if I needed to control that airway, could I do it? And maybe have an Ambu bag or even intubation stuff around. If you do this right, you're going to put somebody in respiratory distress a couple times a year. If you're not <laughs> doing that, you're probably not doing it right. Uh, so uh, they, really, you have to sedate these people to within an inch of their life to get things relaxed enough. And there are many times I look at the patient, no neck, obese person, just had a huge steak dinner at Morton's or something. Now, that's not a patient. I'm going to try this in the emergency room. I'll get an anesthesia colleague to uh, uh, sedate them with respiratory protection. Uh, but if it's a young, thin person, just make sure you have that. And uh, with Narcan, this uh, fentanyl, which I like to use, reverses quickly. Um, the uh, lesions that happen when a shoulder dislocates, and in this uh, drawing, we're looking like this. We're looking up into the armpit. Anterior is up. Ball goes out anteriorly. It usually knocks off the attachment of the capsule to the glenoid, which is called the labrum, and it makes a little dent in the humeral head, which is called a heel sacs lesion. And when we fix these, we repair the uh, capsule attachment, the labrum, back to the bone, and then we take the stretched out floppy capsule and imbricate it, which is called a capsular shift. The heel sacs lesion what doesn't require treatment because it's not in a part of the humerus that articulates with the glenoid. Uh, last topic for glenohumeral joint is arthritis. This just shows the humeral head, which is coated with cartilage. Uh, and cartilage is a miracle, miracle stuff. It's very slick and slippery. It has a coefficient of friction 10 times better than an ice skate on ice and much slicker and slipperier than anything we've been able to invent to take its place. It's also completely numb, one of the few tissues in your body with no nerves in it. So it's an ideal bearing surface, slick and numb. I always tell patients it's just like the stuff you see on the end of a chicken bone, <laughs> and they can uh, relate to that usually. Um, this is what happens in arthritis. That surface of cartilage wears away. It either wears away in osteoarthritis, it gets attacked by rheumatoid arthritis or, or other autoimmune diseases, or in septic arthritis, it's an infection that destroys it. But the, the destination is the same in all of those, and that is a humeral head that is devoid of articular cartilage. And that humeral head now, instead of having a slick, numb surface, has a rough, uh, abrasive surface that's very sensitive. Bone is extremely densely innervated. If you ever had your teeth worked on, you know about that. Uh, and that's a very painful problem. Uh, Treatment-wise, so let me back up. Physical exam, the history for most of the arthritis you're going to see is going to be osteoarthritis. And for those uh, sort of high mileage joints are the ones that get this the most age. And also laborers or people who put a lot of force on their upper extremities. Physical exam, this is interesting because these can look like impingers. You bring them up, and because their shoulders are arthritic and stiff, it hurts when you get to about here. It hurts when you get to about here. And if you stop there, you think, okay, this is an impinger. And the way to tell these people from impingers is with your arm at your side, the patient's arm at their side, impingers will have no problem. They can do this all day long. It doesn't hurt them. It's not stiff because they're not tight. They're not in, uh, nothing's shut down. Arthritics, as you're doing this, you're rotating the ball in the socket. So these people have pain and stiffness with internal and external elbow, or sorry, uh, rotation of their shoulder, which you do with the forearm. Okay, so that's a huge test that you can do simply in the office. The only other patient that will have that exam with pain and stiffness down here is the person with adhesive capsulitis. And you can figure those guys away from the arthritics by taking an x-ray. So the algorithm is uh, people who have pain up here, pain up here, no pain down here, those are the impingers. People that have pain up here, pain up here, and pain and stiffness down here, they're either in, uh, arthritics or the people with cuff adhesive capsulitis, or not cuff, they're just with adhesive capsulitis, and the x-ray will tell these two guys apart, okay? Uh, so without any sophisticated tests, you can really do a pretty good job of diagnosing who's got what. Uh, x-ray wise, uh, this is just uh, an x-ray showing 
And these, this, is, this isn't a great reproduction. This is what glenohumeral joint arthritis looks like. Joint space narrowing, it, there, there is no joint space ever. The ball always touches the socket. But in a normal shoulder, it's the cartilage coating of the ball touching the cartilage coating of the socket. Those coatings are radiolucent, so there's a space on the x-ray, uh, which you can kind of see here. Um, to take an x-ray that'll really show it the best, don't shoot your AP like this. This is how AP x-rays are taken all the time of the shoulder. And remember, the shoulder joint is 45 degrees off of that. So take your AP like that. And this is just shows that's taken like a chest x-ray AP, the incorrect way. This is taken the correct way, 45 degrees from the coronal plane. And if you're going to make judgments about the space, this x-ray will help you a lot more. Uh, the text call that a gray she. I don't know how to spell that, but I've actually had to make that drawing and take it to the places where we get x-rays so they know when Ted Parks asks for a shoulder AP, this is what I want. And it just helps me, uh, helps me see that space. Uh, if it is arthritic, anti-inflammatory medicines like other arthritis supplements, who knows if that helps or not. I, you know, the studies don't say that they do. Some patients feel that they do. I, they don't hurt, so I'm open-minded to using them. A cortisone shot into the glenohumeral joint can help for somebody with glenohumeral joint arthritis. Physical therapy to loosen the capsule and help it expand as swelling occurs, decreases pain. Uh, there's a surgical solution, which is a shoulder joint replacement. And the shoulder joint replacement, we're going to replace the socket with plastic, which is slippery and numb. We're going to replace the ball with metal. The metal has a stem to help keep it in place that goes down the, the canal of the humerus. And this is what a shoulder joint replacement looks like. A good operation with good success rate. Um, let's go back for a second to this patient. This is our cuff tear arthropathy patient. One of the things we used to try for these patients was to put in a shoulder replacement. And unfortunately, the shoulder replacement did that. The ball dislocated up out of the socket superiorly. And that socket component is kind of like a dinner plate. If you press on the edge of it, it flips up. So there's a torque when you are dislocated like this that made the glenoid loosen, the glenoid part come free. So this was a disaster, putting a shoulder replacement in that patient. The solution for this patient, that's just an example of what one looks like when it uh, dislocates up. And that's like their first post-op x-ray after the shoulder replacement. So it isn't, uh, it, it's a problem that happens right away. Um, <clears throat> this is the solution. This is this new eight-year-ago, 10-year-ago now solution. And it's one of those things where you just smack your forehead and wish you would have thought of it. It's so interesting and just an out-of-the-box solution. We put the ball on the socket side. Okay, so this is the, the ball is going to go on the glenoid and the socket we put on the humerus. So when you put this thing together, the humerus with no rotator cuff, okay, remember rotator cuff is gone in these patients, deltoid pulls up and the ball runs into the, so or the socket on the humerus runs into the ball and it can't go up any farther so it rotates. And all you need for this is a deltoid and an arm and a scapula. <laughs> and so you don't have to have a rotator cuff. Uh, and this operation has really helped out a huge legion of patients that we had no solution for before. So this is the reverse ball and socket uh, joint replacement and it is designed for those patients with cuff tear arthropathy or massive deficient rotator cuff pathology. Um, last thing we'll go through this really quickly is AC joint problems. You can have instability or arthritis here too. Instability comes in seven different types but 99% of them are one, two, or three. Type one, you fall onto your shoulder. It really, nothing is torn. But the, the, uh, as you fall, your body weight, which is attached to your clavicle, smacks into the acromion. So there's an acromioclavicular uh, sort of, I don't want to say impingement, but uh, con contusion. And the joint fills with blood. And you have a little bump there and a really tender there. Okay? And the x-rays are normal, though. You might have a little flake of uh, bone that got chipped there. But uh, essentially, x-rays are normal. In a type 2, you tear. The force is downwards, so you have to get upside down, like get thrown off your bike. You tear the AC direct ligaments, but the remote ligaments are intact. And that patient looks pretty similar clinically, a little bump. But on x-ray, there's actually some displacement here. And we define a type 2 as displacement, but not 100%. There's still some overlap between the two bones. That's a type 2. That tells us that these remote ligaments are still intact, but these ligaments are torn. And those usually get better without surgical treatment. They may have a little bit of a prominence, but at least they don't have a scar which is what we'll give them if we operate on them. Um, this is a type 3, so everything's torn. And uh, the, the defect, bigger deformity, and uh, bigger, and this is an extreme example. Uh, if these aren't quite, this one I would probably fix because it's probably protruding through the trapezius, which upgrades it to a 5. But these high-grade AC joint separations can be problematic for patients. We tend to fix those. Uh, they can be treated non-operatively, though. Um, 
Last topic is AC joint arthritis. You can have bone against bone abrasion or, or uh, friction in the AC joint if you wear the cartilage off the ends of those surfaces. Um, history, same thing, age, high mileage patients. The cool thing about this is that uh, the AC joint is subcutaneous. It's easy to find. It's easy to find the collarbone on anybody, even the most obese person, and they just go out until it stops. And if they're tender there, that's a strong sign that they have AC joint uh, impingement, or sorry, AC joint arthritis. Uh, and this is just what an x-ray would look like, joint space narrowing and bone spurs. Uh, we can do anti-inflammatory medications or supplements, maybe, maybe not. Cortisone shot into the AC joint helps. The surgical solution is to actually take out the end of the collarbone. And when you do that, this gap, this space fills up with blood, and then that blood hardens or matures into a rubbery little eraser-like plug of scar tissue. So you're basically rebuilding a soft tissue cushion for them. And we can only get away with this because of these remote ligaments. We don't destabilize the joint by doing that because these ligaments hold the clavicle in its proper place across from the acromion. So a resection arthroplasty, or it has a nickname called a Mumford procedure, is the surgical solution. It works great for AC joint arthritis. So I think that's it. Uh, this slide, I don't even need to show in this group. When I talk to orthopedists, I always try to remind us that if we're seeing a patient and nothing's adding up, the cortisone shot didn't work, the x-rays don't really show anything, uh, a lot of shoulder pain can be referred from other places. And you people are way more familiar with that than I am. Uh, we think about the heart, subdiaphragmatic processes. The one I see the most in my office is neck. Uh, people that, anybody that has shoulder pain that goes down to their fingers and numbness and tingling, probably not a shoulder problem, but they often come in to see me thinking it's a shoulder problem because they have this horrible achy pain in their shoulder. So I've seen a ton of that, seen probably a little bit of the other stuff, probably had but not recognized even more of that. Uh, but uh, the other thing, the literature says that lateral epicondylitis from the elbow can radiate to the shoulder. I haven't seen as much of that, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's common enough that it's on all of our in-training exams, so it must exist. Um, I think that's it. Uh, oh, our questions. So uh, which is least likely affected by subacromial space impingement? Uh, subacromial bursa, that's, that's affected. Supraspinatus, that's affected. Biceps, yes, but the deltoid really isn't. It's outside of that area, so it's not going to be impinged upon. Um, most common place for a shoulder dislocate is anterior for the reasons we talked about. And the reverse ball and socket joint is the one where the ball is on the scapula and the socket is on the humerus. So uh, any questions about any of that stuff? I think we came in right on time. I really appreciate you guys uh, having me over for this. Thank you so much. You bet.